Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the June presentation, uh, 2021, June 2020, 2021 presentation of the Chicago Map Society. My name is Curtis Wright, the president of CMS, and it's a delight to welcome you all as we host Dr. Ann Williams and her presentation on puzzle maps. Uh, but before we get to that, I have just a few brief announcements. Uh, if you're a regular at the MAP Society, then you may recognize June is normally when we've tried to have our annual field trip to the McLean Collection. Uh, obviously, we're not there this evening, uh, but I spoke, I spoke to Tom Hall earlier this week, and it sounds like there's a very real possibility of us being able to drop by later this summer, uh, probably sometime in August. Uh, I'll be sure to share more information on time, policies, transportation, that sort of stuff uh, as soon as I have it. But, you know, we are nearing the end of this thing and, and we do hope to, to get back to whatever in-person normalcy is uh, as soon as we can. Uh, in case it isn't obvious, we're going to skip our normal summer programming break to fulfill your cartographic appetite uh, and look forward to next month's presentation on the designer in Chicago native Edgar Miller. Uh, an expert in numerous medias and a pioneer in the use of graphic art for commercial purposes. Miller also made several pictorial maps, which will be explored by the director of the Edgar Miller Legacy Foundation, Jeff Cruz. Um, it looks like it's going to be a really interesting presentation, so be sure to keep an eye out uh, on your email inboxes for the registration links. Um, right now, looks like we may be able to resume in-person meetings at the Newberry sometime in September nothing concrete. Again, you'll know just as much as I do. As soon as I do, uh, keep an eye on your email for that. If you have any questions or comments, as always, feel free to drop us a line at contact at chicagomapsociety.org if you have uh, any, yeah, any comments or concerns. Uh, just a reminder, tonight's presentation will be recorded and made available on the CMS YouTube page within the next week or so. In case you missed last, month, last month's presentation on the images of Jews and Christian medieval world maps by Dr. Ace Mittman, that should be available early next week as well. Uh, again, Q&A will be available after tonight's presentation. Feel free to submit questions via chat box. You can ask to unmute, raise your hand. There's a number of different varieties via the Zoom window. And now on to the main event. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome tonight's presenter, Dr. Ann Williams. Ann's diverse and impressive career includes two years in the Peace Corps in India, museum curation in New England, economics research at the World Bank, policymaking on Capitol Hill, appearing on television with Martha Stewart, and teaching at Bates University for over 20 years before retiring in 2008. She earned her PhD in economics right here in Chicago at the University of Chicago and has authored two books on jigsaw puzzles, including The Jigsaw Puzzle, Piecing Together a History. She's also an avid collector with the bulk of her extensive jigsaw puzzle collection, including over 100 items from the pre-World War I period alone, now part of the permanent holdings of the Strong Museum in Rochester, New York. So, Anne, it's wonderful to have you this evening. Thank you so much for your uh, time and sharing your expertise. And I will let you share the screen at your convenience. Uh, okay. Um, okay, share screen. Okay, can you see the uh, title page, Curtis? Sure can. Okay. Well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. Um, today I will talk about early jigsaw map puzzles before World War I. They, are also, they were originally called dissected maps in the 18th and 19th century. And I will use that term interchangeably with map puzzle. The term jigsaw puzzle didn't come into use until after 1900. Um, I will start by talking about pre-Civil War puzzles, both uh, European and American. And then I will focus on a subset of American late 19th century puzzles uh, called the silent teachers. Uh, produced by several different um, uh, uh, companies. I, if you do have any questions that we can't get to in chat, 
I should have put this on the screen, but my email is pretty simple. It's puzzles at Bates, B A T E S dot E D U. So uh, children have assembled map puzzles uh, since uh, the 18th century, uh, starting around 1760. Uh, they, the upper class parents of that era would buy map puzzles for their children to teach them geography. Obviously, um, uh, these children were destined to rule the empire, various empires, and they needed to have a, a good grasp of geography. Uh, first, I want to uh, uh, just um, give you a little side on how puzzles are made. Um, you need four things. Uh, an image, and in this case, we're talking about a map, either that you create or one that uh, you purchase. Um, a backing, originally the backing was always a thin piece of wood, um, uh, mahogany in the 18th century, other woods later on. Uh, nowadays, it's mostly cardboard, glue, and material. Uh, what we have in this little um, portrait of a map dissector is um, he's using a fret saw, which uh, you can think of as being like a coping saw, but much longer. By the 19th century, um, the puzzle production was done with mechanized scroll saws uh, that were powered by either steam or water. Um, the two on the left are quite small. The one on the right is actually fits in into a room. The, the, there's, the blade is down here. Um, can you see my arrow, by the way? Yep, we can see your cursor. OK. Um, the blade is here. It's held in two chucks. One is suspended from the ceiling. There's a work surface. And then the other chuck is attached to uh, machinery that's bolted to the floor. Um, by the 1870s, there were some um, uh, uh, foot powered scroll saws that uh, were marketed for home use. Uh, this is the uh, uh, philosophy saw made by the WF and J Barnes Company of Rockford, Illinois, just a little bit north of Chicago. Um, then we have the um, Miller's Falls Company of Massachusetts made this cute little new Rogers saw, um, uh, which cost $3 back in the 1870s. You see, it looks very much like a, a sell treadle sewing machine. And this is the challenge scroll saw, very ornate, uh, made by the Seneca Falls uh, Tool Man Manufacturing Company in New York. Now, back to the map puzzles, who made them? Um, there were several different types of companies that got involved in producing map puzzles. Map makers themselves, uh, some book publishers. Oops, sorry. Um, I'm going the wrong way. Um, makers of children's games uh, and paper toys and firms that specialized in map puzzles. Um, the first puzzles were, the first dissected maps were made in England and Europe. U.S. production started after 1800. Uh, there's quite a debate about who made the first jigsaw puzzle, which happened to be a dissected map. Um, there's, um, there's quite a, a dispute between the Brits and the rest of the Europeans. Um, and uh, but I, I tend, I'm not taking a stand until they work it out, but I tend to favor John Spilsbury of London, England, because for two reasons, we have both extant puzzles and uh, contemporary documentation on his puzzles. Uh, this is um, a map of Europe uh, from the mid 1760s. Uh, Spilsbury was born in, uh, 1739. He apprenticed at age 14 to Thomas Jeffreys. 
Jeffries was a well-known cartographer with the title of geographer to the king. In the 1760s, Pillsbury went into business for himself in London. He died just a few late, years later in 1769. And on his death, a, printer, a general printer named Woodman and Mutlow took over his stock. Um, that company produced just a few puzzles in the early 1770s, but, but not for long. This trade card um, is the uh, contemporary documentation. It shows all the titles that uh, Spillsbury advertised uh, in the um, early 1760s. Uh, there are almost 30 titles here. Um, we have seen about there are about 20 or, or 24 uh, Spillsbury puzzles that have um, uh, are known to exist today. Most of them are the major, <coughs> excuse me, titles, um, the world, Europe, and the other continents. Most of the titles have not survived, um, assuming they were ever made. After uh, Spillsbury died, uh, there were two companies that dominated British uh, production of map puzzles for a couple of decades. Um, the, William Darton and his uh, descendants published books, puzzles, and games for children. Um, this uh, image is from the Rumsey collection. Uh, and you should notice that the, um, the cartouche has a different title from the title on the box. Um, uh, the cartouche says North America, the box title says America. Uh, John Wallace and his descendants, or his son Edward, uh, made uh, dissected maps for almost as long as the Dartons from the 1760s to 1847. Um, the left is a, a map of uh, the United States from uh, Edward uh, Wallace. And I want to just point out some of the perils of, of uh, collecting puzzles uh, in general, which is missing pieces. Um, this puzzle lacked three pieces. I was able to uh, cut uh, pieces to fit them, fit the gaps, but I've never seen a copy of the original map um, to be able to fill in the uh, image. The, the picture on the right is a typical box label from uh, say about the 1830s um, of a Wallace puzzle. Uh, many of the map puzzles of that era showed Britannia sort of ruling the empire, especially if it was a world puzzle. Now, uh, let me turn to the United States. Um, the U.S. imported dissected maps before 1800 and even um, in the last decade of, of the colonial era, era. But as far as we know, domestic manufacturing began only in the 1800s. It grew slowly at first, then it really took off after the Civil War. Uh, there were advances in technology that brought down the price of puzzles. Um, and uh, usage spread to the middle, the emerging middle class at that time. Furthermore, improved transportation, um, railroads in particular, uh, improved uh, distribution networks and um, helped spread the sales from west to east. Andrew T. Goodrich is um, the earliest American maker that I know of. That's not to say that he was the earliest. There may be another earlier one lurking out there. Um, the only known copy of this puzzle is in the New York Public Library map. Uh, there's an ad in the left-hand corner referring to a series of useful and correct dissected maps um, that they are surveying in 1818. Goodrich was followed by a firm in the 20s called uh, F and R Lockwood, also of New York City. But to the best of my knowledge, no Lockwood puzzles have survived at all. I know of one puzzle by a Philadelphia printer in the 1830s, Thomas. <clears throat> and I should mention that um, 
of the individual countries that show up on map puzzles, Palestine was quite common. Moving on to the 1840s, um, this um, puzzle by Kelly and Bowman of Boston is a um, is one of only two puzzles I know of that they made, um, and the other was not a, a map puzzle. Uh, this this um, is from the late 80s, but pre-California statehood. You can see that the um, the map of the West is quite different from what we know today. This puzzle is a little more common, um, an 1850 puzzle by uh, a company near uh, Albany, New York, uh, McCleary and Pierce. I especially like this one because it, it really is very educational. Um, inside the lid is this table of explanations which uh, includes very detailed um, information about the state of New York, um, miles between cities, um, rivers, railroads, um, and much, much more. The back of the box is covered by testimonials from um, people such as Hamilton Fish, who was the governor of New York at that time, um, Emma Willard, who founded a very influential educator, who founded the Troy Female Academy. The way the puzzle is made is also quite different from the ones you've seen already. Um, instead of taking a single piece of uh, wood and uh, pasting a map to it, they actually had each piece was cut separately with a die rather than with a saw. Um, it, I, it's a very, um, very strange way to me to make a puzzle, but, uh, and I haven't seen another one like it. There are four copies uh, that I know of that survive of this puzzle. This is the one from the American Antiquarian Society. There's one in the uh, Rumsey collection, one at the Strong Museum in New York, <clears throat> and um, one in private hands. Um, an, a fa rel rather famous um, map maker, S. Augustus Mitchell, <coughs> excuse me, made this puzzle in 1854. Um, he was famous for his atlases. Um, I'm fond of this one because of this nice little inset of the gold region of California. Uh, he also um, had nice packaging. He put this puzzle in a book-like box. Uh, so you could stand it up um, on your bookshelf with the, and the spine gave the title. Um, he marked the names of the Native American tribes in the appropriate places on that. Uh, Joseph Colton got into the map puzzle business in the 1860s. He too used a, um, a book-like box. This is the back cover and the spine, oops, sorry. Um, and um, then the puzzle itself. Um, he had a, a lower priced range of puzzles that um, came in ordinary wooden boxes with printed labels, um, no graphics on the labels, um, that he sold uh, for uh, much lower prices. After the Civil War, companies uh, uh, that made um, major game companies began making uh, jigsaw puzzles of maps. Um, the three big ones were Milton Bradley in Massachusetts, Parker Brothers in Massachusetts, and McLaughlin Brothers in New York. All three companies made games. Um, uh, McLaughlin Brothers was also known for its, um, its books for children. It also made Valentines and a few other things. Uh, now, my current, oh, here's some examples of those. The Milton Bradley permutation dissected map um, is the first one that I know of on cardboard. It's, it's got all these little circles that um, highlight the names of uh, major cities and, and other uh, important places. 
they were stamped out with a, a round die. After that, they cut they cut the um, the rest of the map into nine large pieces, probably with uh, something like a guillotine. It came with an instructional pamphlet that um, told you a lot um, about the um, United States. Um, here's a Parker Brothers puzzle, um, a later Parker Brothers puzzle, 1890-ish, and a McLaughlin Brothers puzzle from the same <coughs> period. Now, my current research um, looks in detail at a subset of smaller companies, the ones in central New York that made silent teacher puzzles. Uh, they produced these map puzzles in large quantities beginning in 1877 and continuing for about three decades. There were six companies that I know of that made silent teacher puzzles. The first four um, down through Hartman are, collect, are connected to each other. Um, there's pretty strong evidence that Wiggins had um, a business relationship with um, Clemens. Um, and there's a hint that George Tackabury of Canastota, New York, may have had a business uh, relationship with Clemens. I'll come to that a little bit later. The typical silent teacher puzzle um, is easily recognizable. A lot of them turn up on eBay at least a dozen per year. Um, they have a map. They usually have a map on the front. In this case, it's, um, it's a map by the Colton sons, uh, George W. and Charles B., who succeeded their father. Um, some of the early ones, uh, many of the early ones had maps produced by George F. Cram of Chicago. Um, and then there were assortment of, of other map producers, not very many. It has advertising on the reverse. Um, uh, here uh, we see an advertisement for Sherwin Williams paints. And if you look at that advertise that, that side carefully, you can see that it, the puzzle has been cut on county lines. Chautauqua County over here on the um, left, uh, and we have Long Island in the upper right. And if you know your state of New York, you can figure out what all the other counties are just by looking at the back. Um, the, the puzzles typically had green paper edge wraps. Um, and that helped keep um, the paper on both sides um, from uh, uh, getting separated from the wood. Uh, and they, they came in a box. Uh, the early ones had um, boxes with text only on the covers. The later ones, such as this one, had um, pictorial labels. labels. The central figure who linked all these companies, um, or most of these companies, was the Reverend Erastus J. Clemens. Um, it was an eBay listing that pointed me to this article in the March 1911 Utica Sunday Tribune. It was, um, it records, um, I'm sorry. It, it was clearly a puff piece uh, written after map production had ceased, um, but it um, and it was um, it had quite a few errors in it. For example, it um, said that Clemens himself had invented the jigsaw puzzle in 1877, and we've already seen that the earliest uh, jigsaw puzzles go back more than a century. Uh, yet it does record some of the basics of the silent teacher's story. Uh, Erastus Clemens began his career as a Methodist clergyman. He left that profession at a young age for health reasons and then went into the map puzzle business in 1877. This factory picture is from the same article. Um, the factory was in Clayville, New York. 
which is uh, 12 miles south of Utica. And at times, um, according to the article, he employed um, several workers. Uh, he also established a network of agents and house to house cancers to sell his book. The article, uh, the author of the article uh, says that Clemens had, quote, a high sense of religious duty. And he thus added a, an uplifting spiritual tract to each uh, box of puzzles, of, of a, each puzzle box. Uh, I myself have never seen such a tract, but uh, they could have been saved elsewhere or discarded by less religious people. The writer describes Clemens as a deeply religious man who carried on a vast correspondence with people of, of all faiths. Um, other sources reveal additional biographical details of Clemens. And I'm going to refer to the map as, uh, as I talk about them. This is uh, central New York stretching roughly from Syracuse to Utica. Clemens himself was born in Steuben. Um, he studied for the ministry at Casanova, um, uh, Casanova Seminary. Um, he then uh, married uh, Elizabeth Hartman, um, who lived, who came from a, very close to his hometown, about 10 miles away in Boonville, New York. Um, they had twin daughters in 1874. In 1875, he was way over here in up near Lake Ontario. Um, he was a pastor, he lived in Fulton. He was a pastor uh, for two churches, one in Mount Pleasant and one in Amboy. And um, by, at one point, uh, shortly after that, he moved to Norwich, uh, which is 75 miles to the south. And in 1880, he moved to Clayville and was minister of the Methodist Episcopal Church there. Although the 1911 article mentions that a family member took over the business on Clemens' death, it does not elaborate on several companies that made silent teachers over the years. Uh, having studied several hundred of them, I've managed to piece together some of the story, but I'm afraid there are quite a few missing pieces still. The earliest silent teacher puzzles seem to be those made by the Union Sectional Map Company, originally located up here in New Haven at the eastern end of Lake Ontario. Um, then they moved down to Norwich. And um, this is a, a label on an early Union Sectional Map Company puzzle. If you look down here at the bottom, you might be able to read that it says copyright by E.J. Clemens, W.L. Scott, and L.C. Hayes uh, in the year 1877. Uh, Warren Scott and Leroy Hayes were prominent citizens in Norwich. Clemens may have met Hayes in college since they both trained for the ministry at Casanova Seminary. The label present, uh, promotes the educational goals of the silent teacher, saying it would, quote, familiarize the child and impress on the mind in living and lasting form, the division, posi position, and relation which each state holds to its neighbors. It is both interesting and instructive. And as the last sentence of the text says, while on one side it is moral and instructive, on the other it is pleasant and amusing. The, the, exam, the, the map that came in this box is um, moral and instructive on both sides. Uh, the, it is, uh, the first side is the US map, um, it has a, um, uh, and let me, let me just point out that uh, the, Dakota, uh, the Dakota states had not yet uh, gotten their statehood. So there's one Dakota territory. 
And all of what we know now is Oklahoma is uh, named Indian Territory. Uh, uh, the, it has uh, an extensive geography quiz down here at the bottom uh, with, um, oh, I think more than about 30 questions uh, about US and world geography. And down here, we see the name uh, D and MC Wiggins of New Haven, New York. Uh, those were uh, David and Mary and his wife, Mary Wiggins. And we'll come back to them a little later. The reverse of this puzzle uh, shows a world map uh, in various uh, projections. It is surrounded by um, some oddly chosen vignettes. Um, in the middle on each side is the city of Tangier, Morocco, and the city of Punchal, Portugal. The other scenes are uh, generic uh, desert, mountain, and jungle scenes. And it has a, an intriguing text about the history of the world, uh, starting with um, Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden in 4004 BC. And it goes all the way up to Captain Cook in the 18th century. Uh, many of these early um, uh, silent teachers had uh, maps on both sides, but not all of them. Uh, the, uh, here are two uh, puzzles with um, pictorial backs. Uh, the one up here on the, um, Left is a Courier and Ives print. That's a map of the United States. Here's Maine up here and uh, California over here. The, the one on the right seems to have a section of wallpaper on the back. And this is another map of New York State. The US and, the, and New York State were definitely the most popular maps in, um, in the um, Silent Teacher series. Uh, probably because New York State was one of the most populated states in the country at that time. Um, around um, 1881, the company moved from, um, from Norwich, New York, up to Clayville near Utica, uh, where, and Clemens was living in Clayville at that time. From then on, none of the puzzles re uh, refers to Hayes or Scott. It's clear that uh, Clemens was the sole owner of the business. And shortly after the move, he stopped using the uh, Union sectional map brand name. Uh, instead, um, he, he used his own name on the puzzles. Uh, he expanded his offerings uh, to include maps of most of the states east of the Mississippi and north of the uh, Mason-Dixon line. Selchow and Ryder, uh, he, he made a business arrangement with Selchow and Ryder to distribute his, his puzzles. Uh, Selchow and Ryder was a, uh, a game manufacturer, but it was primarily a, a major wholesaler for toys. Um, it was based in New York uh, for many, many years. Uh, Clemens made substantial changes in the appearance of the puzzles as well. Um, he put ads on the backs of the puzzles instead of another map or some other picture. Uh, interestingly, they were always from uh, Cleveland companies, uh, two Cleveland companies, either Sherwin Williams Paints or White Sewing Machines. Um, there were several different type uh, pictures that turned up. Here's another uh, Sherwin Williams on the left, white sewing machines on the right, and two um, white sewing machines um, in this uh, slide. Uh, and white also got into making um, bicycles um, in the late uh, 1800s. Um, Clemens changed the cardboard boxes also. Um, uh, 
Uh, this is um, an early one with a pictorial label. Um, down here on the floor, we see children playing, putting a map puzzle together, and the cat um, being intrigued by the um, box that says Clemens, silent teacher. On the right, we have the, um, the later box cover, which uh, you saw earlier. Um, when Clemens died in 1896, his widow, Elizabeth Clemens, um, ran the business for a couple of years. Then she turned it over to her nephew, Charles E. Hartman, um, who lived in Utica. Now, two other companies made silent teachers uh, in central New York, um, both in the early years. And as I mentioned earlier, I suspect that both were partners, uh, were in a business relationship with Clemens at various times. Um, oh, I'm sorry, this, this slide got out of order. Um, uh, Hartman, the nephew, um, uh, also expanded uh, the, the list of uh, his catalog to include some puzzles of Western states. So back to um, uh, David Wiggins. Um, this is a box uh, for a Wiggins puzzle. Um, down here in fine print, you see it's published by David Wiggins of New Haven, New York. The, the puzzle itself, the map itself um, on the puzzle is um, almost identical to uh, the early Union sectional map puzzles um, with the, um, the map that has the um, quiz underneath and the, the Wiggins name on it. Uh, the text on the label is also um, very similar to what's on the, on the Clemens puzzles. Uh, Wiggins had an agent in uh, Chicago, um, C.A. Warren and Company. I don't know much about them, um, but uh, Westerners were uh, to order from Warren. The price of what this is the only box I've seen with the price on it. One dollar in, um, in uh, the 1870s, 80s uh, was the equivalent of a week's uh, income for the average American. So you can see these were not inexpensive items. The second company that uh, was that I believe had some tie to, um, may have had some tie to Clemens, was uh, George Tackerbury. Uh, Tackerbury uh, lived in Canastota, New York. Uh, he had a long career uh, publishing atlases, school charts, maps in both the US and Canada. Uh, he worked, a couple of his books worked with him. He made these puzzles around 1880. Some were called silent teachers. Some were called kindergarten geography. This protect, particular one was had both brand names on it. Uh, it was Tackerbury's silent teacher and kindergarten geography. Um, his maps were quite different from the Clemens maps or the the, the Cram and the um, and the Colton maps that Clemens generally used. Um, they have the four time zones uh, for the United States up at the top. Uh, they have a quiz down, a different quiz down on the bottom. There's an elevation, which is hard to see in this slide. And over on the right, uh, they have a list of, of international cities uh, placed at the appropriate uh, latitudes. Um, for them. Uh, Tackerbury's maps were edged in green paper, just like uh, Clemens. Um, a few have white sewing machine advertisements on the backs, but the vast majority have plain paper on the backs. The boxes are all uh, completely made of wood with sliding lids. Uh, Clemens, on the other hand, all of his boxes had some cardboard in them. Um, and uh, some boxes were entirely cardboard. 
I have seen one puzzle that has a Clemens uh, map on the front and a Thackeray map on the back. Um, unfortunately, it lacks the box, so I, it doesn't reveal much about the uh, any possible relationship between um, Clemens and Thackeray. So uh, I'm sorry, I've gone a little long here. Um, in conclusion, the silent teacher map puzzles achieved a wide distribution in the US for three decades. They taught geography through play. They conveyed commercial messages. And the, the story of the silent teachers is also the story of a set of small businesses in central New York, um, inspired by an entrepreneurial clergyman. Uh, finally, a, a word of caution. Um, like many puzzles in progress, this research has many missing pieces, as well as some pieces that don't quite fit. Um, I, um, I want to um, thank you for attending and um, uh, urge you to come to Maine sometime, the ideal place to relax and learn with a jigsaw puzzle. And I have had a lot of assistance uh, for this paper from a whole list of people who are by no means responsible for any errors. Wonderful. Well, thank you so, so much. That's it. Uh, that was fantastic. And I'd now like to open things up to um, the questions. Uh, I know that, so there's a couple of questions that I had regarding the nomenclature that's used. So dissected and silent teachers both stood out to me as very interesting and direct words. And I was wondering if you knew more about if their use was part of a broader cultural reference, if they were deliberate because the dissected maps are part of a whole, or if, if you could talk a little more about about that. Well, dissected map simply means it's cut into pieces. Um, I understand that in England, there's some folding maps that fit into a little pocket that um, uh, a, a little um, packet, sorry, um, that are sometimes called dissected maps because in order to make it, they were uh, put on linen and the, first cut up and then uh, put on linen, linen and then folded. Um, silent teacher is, so, is something that shows up in uh, education, um, in some other educational literature, um, uh, particularly educational toys uh, used by um, uh, some teachers. Um, and object lesson, which I didn't mention, but um, is referred to on the inside labels of the silent teacher puzzles. Uh, object lesson teaching uh, involved hands-on um, uh, learning. So uh, that all three of those, uh, that's what I can tell you about all three of those terms. Uh, I have to remind you I'm a puzzle expert, not, not a map expert, not an education expert. No, that's, and I guess I, I was thinking silent versus resuscitation or, you know, like other forms of, of learning. Yeah. Um, forms. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, it, for in England, um, math puzzles were considered appropriate for Sunday play. Uh, and also religious puzzles were considered appropriate, but uh, puzzles with pictures on them uh, for people who were um, quite religious uh, were often uh, prohibited. Uh, Sunday was supposed to be a day of devotion and, and so on. Gotcha. Uh, we got a couple of questions from, thank you for that answer, by the way. Yeah. A couple of questions from Dr. Edney. Have you done any research of patent records? Um, um, a, a little bit. Um, there there aren't um, there aren't many patents. Well, there are a lot of patents on puzzles, um, mainly um, on the way in which they were made, what technology was used to make them, um, or and the specific form of the puzzle. 
but I haven't found anything specific on silent teachers. Uh, the early uh, union sectional map puzzles were copyrighted and I haven't yet made a, a, an effort to find that 1877 copyright record. Um, uh, there are most of the, uh, many, some of the illustrations I showed you on the saws are patent illustrations. There are, there are a lot of improvements to scroll saws that came out in the uh, 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, when the jigsaw mats, so when did those jigsaw maps get more random cuts rather than being divided along political boundaries? Um, the random cuts um, uh, came along, um, fairly early in pictorial puzzles, in pictorial puzzles. So it might have, a, an English puzzle might have the, um, um, you know, a picture of the Great Fire of London or the Crystal Palace in the 19th century. Um, and that would be, um, all the outside pieces would be interlocking pieces and the inside pieces would be all randomly cut. Uh, in, when we get to the 20th century for puzzles for adults, um, which is a whole different um, can of worms, uh, there was a lot of uh, random cutting, uh, non-interlocking cutting, um, uh, you know, interlocking cutting, all kinds of variations on the cutting style. It's sort of going off that, you had mentioned that there were a lot of puzzle maps of New York and a lot of puzzle maps to the United States. Uh, yes. From your experience, did you see did the puzzle maps of the United States, were they updated iteratively to reflect new states as they were admitted to the Union? Well, the, uh, the major, since they started in 1877, there were only a few uh, states that came in after that, or the ones, some of the ones that came in after that were territories that had the same exact shape as um, the states. Mm -hmm. um, in 1889, the Dakotas were divided. So that's one way to, um, to date the puzzle. Um, Oklahoma um, was shown entirely as Indian territory in the 1870s. By um, a little bit later, it's half Indian territory and half um, Oklahoma. And then Oklahoma became a state in, um, oh gosh, uh, 1908, 1903, I can't remember which. And uh, then it's all Oklahoma. Uh, but uh, they did, many of the map puzzles didn't distinguish between a territory and a state. Gotcha. Um, um, the, um, uh, so the biggest changes you see are in the pre-Civil War puzzles. And I actually don't know um, if how, um, you know, if Clemens, for example, had bought a pile of images of the United States in 1888, if he had used them all up by 1889 when the Dakotas were separated. You know, he may have kept on uh, using them for a little bit after that. Um, so it's, um, uh, so that's something I don't know. Gotcha. It looked like in one of your earlier images, there was a tiny little square in like the northeast corner of the Colorado Territory that that prompted that question. So that, that's, ah, OK, um, um, well, the um, Yellowstone Park was set up, I think, in 1872. Um, but before that, I, I'm not sure what that would have been. Gotcha. And Yellowstone uh, was in Wyoming, not, not Colorado. It, it may very well have been. So it may it could have yeah, been Yellowstone. Yeah. yeah. Uh, any other questions or comments for Dr. Williams? Uh, you can find her book, I'm sure, on Amazon, her books on Amazon, uh, if you're interested in learning more about jigsaw puzzle history. Um, again, her, her email is puzzles at bates.edu for any questions that, that come to mind. Uh, Dr. Williams, anything else you'd like to share? Nope. Um, um, thank you very much. It's really been a pleasure.
absolutely the pleasure is all ours again the, the presentation should be up on youtube in a couple of weeks um thank you all for joining and we hope you all have a great evening okay thank you take care